All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Donna Miller, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Purse Power. Purse Power is working to help women use their massive purchasing power to drive positive change. We believe that if women who make 80% of all purchasing decisions would choose to buy from the companies that support women, and we could create a funding stream for better women's shelters in the process, that we could shatter glass ceilings and change lives. So that's what we're hoping to do here at Purse Power. Um, we do, uh, we are taping the program. We do this every Friday at 10 central. Um, all of our prior broadcasts are on our website, pursepower.com forward slash coronavirus. So you can go into the let's share the journey tab. And we've got about 90, um, prior episodes with amazing women across the country, much like Susan, who's our guest today. Thank you so much for being here, Susan. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, of course. I appreciate it. All right. So um, let me go ahead and introduce Susan Shears. And Susan is our attorney here at Purse Power. She's amazing. She's ranked in the top 1% of 50,000 plus US trademark attorneys in the country. And she has over 25 years of experience counseling clients around intellectual property law. Um, she's also a longtime member and former general counsel of the National Association of Women Business Owners and has actively collaborated with entrepreneurs and business owners in the formation of their businesses and handling of their business transactions, both in the US and internationally. And again, she helped us with our trademarks. Uh, Ms. Chairs graduated from Emory University and has her Juris Doctorate cum laude from the University of Georgia Law School. She also, uh, prior to entering private practice in 1979, she was a trial lawyer for the US Department of Justice and started her own firm in 1985. So you've been at this a while. <laughs> Yes, I have. <laughs> very good, very good. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. Okay, to get started, we want to get to know you. Kind of give us your backstory, if you would, and we'll go from there. Yes. Um, uh, when I graduated from law school, uh, my major interest was in civil rights, the civil rights area. And so I joined the Justice Department as a trial lawyer um, and, and was there for four or five years trying civil rights cases. But while I was there, I got very interested in the arts, and in particular, an organization in Washington called Washington Women's Arts Center. And it was just, I just fell in love with it. And then these, these women that were artists were all, always asking me questions about protecting their artwork. And of course, I knew nothing at that point about it. So I started taking courses and learned more about intellectual property. And from there, it was just, it was just such a great love of mine to be in that field, which intellectual property, which I'll get more to it. Um, you know, it covers so many aspects of the arts and, and, and just in general in commerce. And meanwhile, at the same time, I was also um, getting very interested in women's entrepreneurship. And I learned about the National Association of Women Business Owners. So I joined the chapter in Washington, DC, and I learned a lot from a lot of these fellow on, for these entrepreneurs. And so that just sort of, uh, I guess the combination of my interest in entrepreneurship, which because of the energy and the innovation and excitement of it, I, I really think there's a lot in common between entrepreneurship and artists, people that are involved in the art. There's a lot of self-creation, a lot of innovation. So basically from there, um, I, my my area of interest uh, of interest became um, the arts um, and entrepreneurship together. So, in addition to being an intellectual property practitioner, I also work with a lot of small businesses and helping them start their business, helping them start their businesses. So, it's a combination of business and intellectual property. That's my practice. And just to, just to add about Nabo, although I'm the former general counsel, I'm currently their current intellectual property counsel. So I handle all of NAPO's trademarks as well. Oh, very good. We're going to trademarks come back to NAPO in a well. bit. Okay. So you've gained some recognition around your work in the trademark area. And again, you guys, I've used her personally. She is very, very good at this. She knows exactly what she's doing, has a quick turnaround time, does an excellent job. But tell us more about that recognition that you got. Right. And there's actually, uh, in addition to the trademark area, I wanted to mention two things that I did that I thought were especially rewarding and exciting to me. And they were in the copyright area. But to start off with the trademark, the reason that I got that 1% ranking was due to a firm that's called Husky. And Husky is involved strictly with data analysis. They are so involved very much with, art, with um, artificial intelligence, which is another field that's interesting to me and I'll get to a little bit later. 
But what they did, and I didn't even know about it, was they did a complete data analysis of the trademark office and who was practicing there. And they looked at the practitioners who were basically filing applications and filing renewals and filing other maintenance documents. And they were looking at office actions that were entered and how many people were successful at get it solving them and so on and how many people were getting registrations and much to my great shock i got an email telling me congratulations we've ranked you in the top one percent of effectiveness at uh, trademark applications registrations renewals etc and they gave me this little badge I sent a copy to Donna that I can now put on this website that will be launching soon. I'm upgrading my website and it'll be launching soon. So I was really pleasantly surprised about that. But I think the unique thing about that, and I think it, it's interesting for the future, is that this ranking was not based on what your friends thought of you, what your colleagues thought of you, uh, what university you went to, or any of these things that we normally think are important, you know, in getting your status. It was strictly based on data. Just, just data of success, and I thought that was great. And I'd like to see a lot more of, um, of awards or or kudos to people based on the data, as opposed to who they know or where they went to school. So that's Thanks just that's just my comments for the day on that. But the two copyright things that I wanted to tell you about, uh, which were to me very exciting, um, one of them was that I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the film The Devil's Advocate, mm -hmm. but the, the Devil's Advocate when it came out it literally copied one of my clients um, religious works that that was called ex nihilo or out of nothing it was a, a bas relief that was on the uh, one of the wings of the national cathedral in washington and they basically you know this was warner brothers and they basically copied the whole thing and they inserted it in the uh apartment that supposedly the devil was occupying and in the part in the course of the movie, it was a long time ago. I don't know how many of you actually saw the original, but in the movie, the scene, the bar relief, these figures in it, and it's all of these figures that are coming out of nothing. You know, as, as Genesis is part of the story of Genesis, and they start writhing and start having sex with each other in the, in the wow. film. I remember the scene. Like, my my client obviously had a heart attack over that and so it ended up that we collaborated with the co-owner of that image um of the cathedral uh, it was in, uh it was actually the national cathedral that co-owned that image and we filed a lawsuit and we actually won that lawsuit you know based on stealing the copyright uh and that got a lot of press we were in the hollywood reporter and you know, like all kinds of kinds of things so that was just something that you know i'm very proud of that i was able to do that really got a lot of national recognition and then the other one that i didn't get as much recognition in the u.s but it was incredibly fun and that is that um i had had made some contacts in italy and one of them was this guy that ran a sunday show and he saw the film jurassic park and so he was just dying to do something with jurassic park so I learned that there was a group that had created a museum exhibition based on Jurassic Park. And it had been like around the United States, primarily in California. So what I did was I was able to contact them and organize with them to bring that exhibition to Rome. Um, and so that's what I did. That was a number of years ago, but that was that I, I mentioned that because it sort of tells you a little bit about the possibilities of intellectual property and the things that you can do. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I like the field so much. Interesting. Wide ranging. Wow. OK. All right. Very, very good. So tell us about intellectual property. What exactly is it? How can you tell what classifies as, as intellectual property? And then why should we protect it? OK, well, first of all, I want to clarify there's two types of intellectual property. There's what we call the registrable type where you can actually register it. And that would be uh, copyrights, trademarks and patents. Um, and to distinguish those, a copyright is a work that's original and creative in nature and also has to be fixed in some kind of tangible form. It can't just be an idea. So, it, you know, what qualifies is a work of art, a play, software, music, musical composition. Uh, all of those are copyrightable because they are original and they're creative, assuming that they are original <laughs> and creative in nature and they are fixed in some type of form that can be transferred from one party to the next. 
Then there's the trademarks, which often I found with my clients get confused with, with the copyrights. People are always talking about registering their copyright, but they really mean their trademark. And the trademark is um, it's either like a, a word or a, sim, or a creation of a combination of words or uh, something that is just like a slogan or a tagline that goes along with it. And it, it's intended strictly to be in commerce. You know, something that distinguishes your goods and services from somebody else's goods and services. And that, as Donna in, indicated, you know, is purse power. Purse power is a trademark. A, uh, another trademark, which is actually a slogan, is we have it, let's use it, which is another one of my favorites, you know, in, in, uh, in purse power. Also, examples of trademarks would be like Nike, would be like like Walt Disney when it uses it to uh to brand its uh cartoons and other uh, and other motion pictures so i would imagine that just about everyone that has a business has some type of trademark or another and a lot of them don't bother to register but they're nevertheless they're still trademarks the only thing that really wouldn't qualify as a trademark is something that's just literally descriptive like for example, house, you know, someone in the real estate business just, you know, they 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 say we sell houses. That's not going to be a trademark because it's nothing but just but of a description of what their services are. Um, and then the last group is patents, and I can't say very much about that because I'm not a patent lawyer. But a patent represents an invention. The type of creation involved is an invention, and in order to be protected with a patent, you absolutely have to register that. There's no such thing as like an unregistered patent. That's the whole nature of it. And people register patents primarily like in the pharmaceutical area, you know, if they, anything like equipment, uh, anything that's electronic, you know, all of those things are patents. Now I've registered trademarks for a couple of, couple of patents like pharmaceuticals, but that's just really not the field that I'm in, if anyone should have any interest in exploring a patent, um, you know, I, I have patent lawyers I work with. I'm always happy to refer refer people. Perfect. Who My dad say? had 22 patents. What, I'm sorry? My dad had 22 oh, patents. Great. Good for yeah. him. I do wanna mention just briefly that there is other type of IP that's not registrable. And one of these is the right to publicity. And that is that you've become a famous person um, you, 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 you can stop people that are trying to trade off of your name. So like, say, some, say for example, you know, someone uh, tried to sell products pretending to be Kim Kardashian. Well, she would have a right of publicity. She could sue that person, you know, for the unlawful use of her name. So there's that. And then there's also what we call, this, these are just examples of unfair competition. And that's where someone doesn't necessarily use your mark, but they copy like the trade dress of what you're doing, like a restaurant that had a unique look or a neat theme, and then somebody else decides they're going to do the same thing um, and copy it and then trade off of it, then that's that's unfair competition. And there are different lawsuits. These are uh, IP that you, the only thing you can do with it is just file a lawsuit as opposed to like opposed registration, you know, of somebody's trademark or copyright. Okay, I've got a question that's a little that I hadn't thought of till now, and I hope yeah. I, you can address it. Um, with AI and this um, GPT chat thing that's going on, where people are writing stuff with the computer, like AI is writing it, I wonder what you know impact it's going to have on this on your industry. Oh well, and actually, when you mentioned something about you know at the end of the talk about what do you what do you see as big issues in 2023, that's one of them. But I'll go ahead and talk about it now because I do think it's incredibly interesting. And the way that I've been, uh, I guess, interacting with it is that in the in the art world, because you can feed in certain characteristics, you know, into this computer that that does AI, and they can create almost perfectly the same thing that someone actually drew. But it's, it's to me, I mean, I actually saw, they, they, they had some examples of someone that had done a cartoon and they showed the person's original artwork and then they showed the AI one that was generated based on information put into the computer. And it certainly in my mind was not identical, but it was what I would call substantially similar to what the person did. So what the issues are in my mind um, are that 
given this situation, first of all, who actually owns this product? Because only a human can own a copyright. And so, the in fact, it's being argued right now as to what ownership, you know, or, or is it just always just in the public domain, you know, when, when something had, I'm sure companies that spend time doing it don't want that. Uh, so there's big arguments right now about what, you know, who should actually own AI. But I do expect, just like in my situation where AI was my friend because it did all that data analysis mm -hmm. <laughs> and helped me and got me recognition. But, you know, it, it's got a lot of implications, I think. You know, it's got to be sorted through. I mean, it's going to definitely impact the, especially the copyright laws, not so much the trademark laws, probably some of the patent laws too. But um, trademarks are trademarks. AI can't impact them that much. You know, um, but it's mainly the imagery, I think. Yes, but I just sort of say stay stay tuned because I think the issues are really incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, it's amazing. All right, so tell me um, if we have something protected, if we have IP that is protected and somebody uses it, what recourse do we have? Well, uh, it, it depends on the type of IP that you're talking about. And in, in this discussion, I'm going to exclude patents. As I mentioned, that's not really my field. But, uh, okay. you know, so if you find out that somebody is violating your IP, you know, this, uh, this is not true of every lawyer, but it is true of me. And I always start out with writing a notice letter. If, it's pos if you can find the people. I mean, one thing is it's, it's sometimes problematic to even find the people who are doing mm -hmm. it. It just shows up on somebody's website. And you're not really sure the origin of it, but to the extent that you can find who the person is, you know, then my policy is to write a notice letter, basically stating, you know, you're violating the RIP and you stop, you know, or else we'll take legal action. And that that actually, I think, is a really good approach because there are a lot of people that sort of unwittingly do it. They don't really under the general public does not understand IP very well. And yeah. a lot of people, especially if they've seen something on another website that may have been copied illegally, they think they can use it. And so uh, sometimes it's very time consuming to have to go after these folks. And um, and the same is true with trademarks, whether it's a copyright, whether it's a trademark, I always, I always start off with the notice letter. Um, and hopefully that works. If it doesn't, then you have to look at the other options. Um, there are not any really great options um in most situations because it, it's so expensive to like bring, bring a lawsuit and the copyright office doesn't provide really great remedies for small businesses when they're when they're uh when they're designed or when their education materials or when their play or whatever is copied uh, about the best you can do a lot of times is just get an injunction but you know one of the things that i re highly recommend for people that have copyright copyrights or trademarks that are really really essential to their businesses is definitely register mm -hmm. um, register those copyrights because um, you know they are really the, the they're, they're the source of a lot of people's bread and butter and so you know under under the copyright law if you've registered prior to infringement then you have much better remedies you are entitled to get attorney's fees if you don't register and someone infringes you are not entitled to the same remedies so you know, if you have a copyright that's really important to your business, I strongly encourage registering it. Very good. Well, I think you did something creative. If you want to talk about that, we, we somebody was using Purse Power, and uh, you helped me with her, and she wasn't responding to us. So you went to Facebook, right? Yeah, I can't. You have to refresh my recollection on that. Um, I do know that we we. Uh, I think I think we may have gone to Facebook to just show that she was actually uh, infringing on your trademark. I think, I think you did, and they shut her down uh, in terms of her being able to publicize what she was doing because she couldn't use that platform. Because oh yeah, we had I think, the yeah. I, I, oh, I know what it was. It wasn't Facebook. It was um, the organization that is Eventbrite. It was like one of those event. Okay. I think that's what it was. Now that I, I'm remembering it, yeah, we went to them. That's right. We complained because she was she was advertising her programs on using Eventbrite, and we did uh, we did shut her down. And then we also uh, she had applied for a trademark registration, and we basically um, watched that very carefully. It turns out that uh, as I expected, that the trademark office refused registration, and then she just dropped it. Yeah, yeah. So it, it worked. It really worked, and I thought you were very effective at it. 
Okay. Well, that's, that's another <laughs> thing. I try to be really creative about these kinds of things. If you can't win one way, you know, you, you, uh, you know, try to contact people that they're doing business with. And most of those people don't want to get caught up in the web. You know, so they, right. they uh, you know, they cooperate. Right. Okay. The other thing that I was wondering, uh, so we get a lot of coaches and consultants involved with purse power. Um, how do we keep ourselves from infringing on other people's copyrights and trademarks? So for example, as a consultant, if I'm wanting to, there's a book that I think is amazing that has great content in it. And I want to share that with my clients. For example, I don't know what I can do and can't do about that. Well, um, I mean, it, it's a, it's kind of a fine line really about, you know, how much you can use of a book versus something that rises to the level of infringement. And it also has to do with like who owns the copyright. And I'll say right off the bat that Walt Disney is not one to tangle with. <laughs> never, never copy anything from Walt Disney um, because they really are very litigious. And they'll, they've, they've even shut down elementary schools that have tried to put images of Mickey Mouse on the walls. I mean, they're, they're really, so you have to be, you have to, first of all, look, who's, who owns this property? And then from there, um, you go with, um, if, I mean, if you want to use, I mean, if, if you're, let me back, step back a bit. Um, if you're just starting something new and you want to like uh, pick a trademark for your business or pick an image for your business and you're starting off, then I would highly recommend that you have someone, and I don't recommend you yourself, but have someone do searches uh, to make sure that no one has already registered this or no one is already claiming this. Um, there is a, a trademark search site that I go to immediately if someone is presenting to me a possible new trademark and I go there and search it. I don't recommend that individuals search their own trademarks because there's a lot of nuances to it. And just because you haven't found a direct hit doesn't mean that it's free to use. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of different things you have to do. But searching when you're starting out, like a new trademark or a new copyright, that's really, really important. But if you're already, you know, just like your example, you know, already in in um, in business and you just want to share something from a book, then, um, you know, my practice, and again, I don't mean to be giving anyone legal advice. I don't want this to come back to bite me. Well, yeah. Susan Chair said in that room that I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> this I'm just this is basically not intended to be any legal advice as everything is different but um you know if the client is willing to actually themselves write to the author or the publisher to quote that's the best way that's by far the best way but if it's something that is just really sort of minor and you're not doing it in a way to incorporate this as part of your own creative product, but doing it in, a, in the form of sort of analysis or commentary, then I think that you probably would be in the land of what we call fair use. You know, and fair use is an exception to exclusive right to use copyrights. Um, if uh, certain conditions are met and they include um, the extent of what you're copying, whether it's a commercial or nonprofit use, whether it interferes with the copyright owner's ability to exploit their own work. So, um, but fair use is, it's, it's like a, it's nothing that's absolutely set. Um, so, you know, like I said, you know, I think, for example, if you're, if you're giving a review of an art exhibition and you're just writing the review and you're commenting and you're making pic you're copying pictures of the artwork and commenting on them, I think that's most likely fair use. Uh huh. Well, most what I was thinking is like some some author has a great concept and I communicate where the concept came from and then I mm -hmm. teach people the concept. That's what I was wondering about personally. Well, I mean, I think that's that's just sort of a fine line. Before you do that, Donna, you can come and talk to me, and we'll go <laughs> we'll go there. But you know, I think in general, you know, edu ed using using something for education uh -huh. many times is considered fair use. But for example, teachers that like take a textbook or another book and copy huge pages out of it and hand it out to their class, that's always considered copyright infringement, even though it's used for educational purposes. Uh huh. Okay. And guys, go ahead and ask your questions. If you've got things coming to mind, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, let's see here. So, you know, you, you are a huge advocate for women in business. You've been at this a while. I know you've got the relationship with NABO. We were talking about trying to promote ourselves with NABO mm -hmm. earlier. 
But anything else you have to say around um, our collective future as female business owners, where this is going um, and how to be successful? Okay, uh, well, the one of the first things that, you know, I wanted to mention is that, um, that I think that right now, for a lot of may primarily probably younger women starting their own businesses, or even um, women that, you know, have been in other fields and are now starting their own businesses. I think the way things are going right now in terms of women in, in general, is that there's now there are a lot of elements right now in the economic world that are trying to reassert the dominance of men in, in the economy. I mean, I think we can see that from the reversal of Roe v. Wade and uh, other types of like criticism that's landing on a lot of on a lot of women. And so I think that that's there. But on the other hand, I think that there is going to continue to be at least incremental progress for women. And one of the reasons for that is that I think women are really making a lot of money. You know, the ones that succeed, you know, are making a, a huge amounts of money. And I think that, you know, the, in, the companies in general and the economy in general um, you know, they appreciate that. I mean, they, they want, they want part of the party, you know, to do something like that. You know, they're not, they're not going to hammer on, unless you happen to be, I'm trying to think of the lady that just got, uh, convicted of a crime because she lied about her, her, it was a, some type of a blood test or something. Does is, is anyone remember, I can't think of this woman's name. Something yeah. like Elizabeth Harding or something like that. She, you know, you, you have to be careful even when you're, even when you're a woman making lots of money that you, you know, go by the rules or else you could get yourself into trouble. But um, I do think that um, that there are more and more women, you know, are starting their own businesses. Certainly there are a lot of people in NABO that yeah. have been, that have created incredibly successful businesses. Um, but like in terms of marketing through NABO, um, NABO has a number of different vehicles for networking within the organization. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is, I just registered the trademark for it, but it's called the NABO Empower Hour. And it's, um, it's like a, a, a web-based uh, hour that takes place, you know, I think maybe about once a month where women get together and share information, share the successes they've had, um, share referrals. So there's, that's one of them. And then the NABO sponsors these lunch and learn events, like constantly through the chapters, mm -hmm. you know, where you can tune in and, and different people give different talks. Um, and then for me, I mean, where I've gotten a lot of my business from NABO, other than just NABO itself, is by going to their annual conferences. And that's where you have a lot of people there and you can meet so many people. And, you know, I've gotten several really great clients, you know, from having gone to those, to those conferences. But, um, uh, and, you know, of course, you know, becoming a member of NABO really helps because then you have access to all the things they're doing. And they put out every Sunday, they put out a, an email that's called uh, uh, the next week's happenings, where they have a list of, of, of all the different uh, things that are going on. Well, very interesting. So if you're a member and like, like Nan, for example, she's got classes that she's producing. Could she put some kind of entry in that about what's coming up this week? Sure. Well, I mean, I, the, I think for Nan, one of the better things to do would be um, to try to uh, get named as a workshop presenter mm -hmm. you know, at the conference. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's where you have a lot of people show up and, and your name gets out there to everybody in the whole organization. And but, you know, absolutely, I think contact and I can I, I can email you uh, for to pass on, Donna, the names of the people or the name of the person to get in touch with um, okay. who can, um, you know, then I guess pass on that information. But I'll send you everything that I've got in terms of what NABO offers. But uh, it's an energetic organization and it's, it's really staying up to speed you know, in my opinion, and they give great conferences. I mean, you went to one. Yes, I did. One time. I think it, it, yes, 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 I agree. They're they a lot of fun. Cool. They're great, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to keep, you guys keep asking your questions. Um, so what issues do you see coming up in 2023 around intellectual property? And uh, well, is there okay, anything that you need to be aware of? Yes. Um, well, I already mentioned the importance of AI. And to sort of stay tuned with that because that's a field that is definitely integrated with 
intellectual property that you know everybody needs to be aware of. The, the other one that I can think of, um, which is really interesting to me, is that the uh, Federal Trade Commission uh, under the Biden administration has just issued a proposed ban on non-compete agreements. Uh -huh. And um, it's, it's unclear where that's going to go. As you can imagine, corporations are pushing back on that. Uh, what I think what they're intending to do, and actually I agree with it to some extent, um, is that in the sort of in the worker community, people that are actually working as employees of companies, uh, but also some contractors and some federal um, contractors that tie up their employees by not permitting them to work in another company for a certain period of time. And I had had um, uh, the experience myself as, well, uh, as a doctor that I recently saw, um, she had to move her office away from the, her normal office. It, it, was, it was actually an office that was located near the Annapolis area in Maryland. And because she had signed, when she, when she signed a lease for her, uh, her office practice, uh, she had signed like a non-compete agreement as part of that. And then she later wanted to move out for various reasons. They imposed the non-compete agreement and she had to literally move away from her office into like this remote area of Maryland um, mm -hmm. for a good like six months before she could move back to her office. So it definitely, you know, non-competes definitely impact people. And uh, the reason that I'm, I think, someone in favor of this, that when, when non-competes are employed against your just sort of regular employees, you know, not some expert, you know, not the person that's in charge of uh, creating a brand new software that's unique, you know, to your company, but just somebody that's there working for you. I, I think it really does create a hardship if that person, you know, wants to leave, um, you know, for whatever reason, Maybe they want to move to a, you know, a different location for, you know, economic reasons, and then they're prevented from doing that. So, you know, I'm actually in, in favor of it to some extent. But of course, if you've got an employee who's doing work in your company and the work that they're doing is integral to your success of your company and it involves your IP or involves other aspect of your business, then I, then I would agree with it because you're paying that person to perform a certain service that's has a future, you know, with your company. You don't want them going off and starting their own business. But I think for business owners, so, so please stay tuned about that because it could impact, you know, a lot of people that have that have employees if you if you do create um, non-compete agreements. But one of the things that you can do uh, in the event that you you want to prevent someone from like taking your materials and, and your work product to another place is through protection of IP, is through registration of your essential materials as a copyright, and also in your uh, employment agreement, making sure that they understand that the tr that what trademarks that you own and that they cannot use those trademarks in any uh, subsequent business that they may want to start on themselves. So I think that, that that part will really help business owners if this ban does go through. Um, and that's, by the way, this to be, the, the non-compete agreement is to be distinguished from an, um, a confidentiality agreement. Mm -hmm. Confidentiality agreements are really important if you've got a business where there is a lot of confidential information and confidential know-how. And those are completely legit as far as I'm concerned, um, that people can't take things that they've learned that are uh, confidential in your business to though go and use that confidential information for their own businesses. So I highly recommend putting, you know, putting, putting excuse me, um, confidentiality agreements, you know, in your employment agreements, but be careful about the non-competes. It's interesting because what was going on in my head is I was thinking if you've got somebody doing sales for you or something and they've got a book of business and they take the customers with them, I don't know, how, how do you protect yourself from that that's, a, that's that's that is a really good um you know good point and what i do with that is, is don't make it specifically non-compete like well no you can't start a business unless you move 50 miles away it's more of a non-solicitation agreement so they agree that they're not going to they're not going to solicit or accept business from any of the customers that they've gotten you know while they're under your umbrella 
for a certain period. Like you say, it's a year. And that's different than a strict non-competition. It's like you can't start a business in another location type of thing. Okay. Very good. No, that's really helpful stuff. Uh, and Nan was following up on her question about Novel to ask if you can sell books at the back of the room if you do a workshop at the conference. Do you know? Um, I, in my experience of having gone there, I mean, yes. In fact, a lot of the uh, people that attend the workshop would love to get the book. In fact, Nabo sells a ton of books of, of that their members have. You know, they have like a whole area where people can buy books and get them signed. The only mm -hmm. thing, Nan, this would be what I would suggest is before doing this, I would join Nabo. <laughs> I, I, they're much more receptive, you know, when it's a member, you know, and then, you know, the membership is not that expensive. Yeah. And that gives you that gives you kind of a, you know, a real carte blanche to start promoting yourself. And not Nabo's all in for promoting its members. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Um, OK, guys, do you want to come off uh, mute and put your cameras back on? Let's have a conversation, see if there's any other questions that you have before we close up today. Um, let's see here. Well, thank you for being here, everybody. This is great. Any other questions or comments? What a quiet group today. <laughs> um, I had a question. I'm uh, doing in uh, March a web a, uh, a webinar for uh, about 250 people, teachers in Albania. And um, I was just told that it's um, their discipline is shame or praise. And I was with, talking with the person I'm doing this with, talking about love and logic, and it's two gentlemen. Uh, Faye Klein and I asked her about copyrights the person I'm working with and she said well in Albania they don't care and I thought well <laughs> that's but I have to cover myself here so I'm just wondering how I go about doing that without um, protecting myself as an educator. Well um, I mean actually I don't know specifically about Albania but um, <laughs> there is a con there there are like international conventions where different countries all subscribe to this particular convention and uh, if you're if you're a member you know of the convention then that means that a person like a, a u.s author for example mm -hmm. would be able to have the same protections for her work that albanians give to their citizens that create work i don't know if albania is actually a member if you email me i can check um, and Donna yeah, will have my head. I can know, check and see, but that's basically to help, you know. almost, almost every country in the world, mm -hmm. you know, is a member of this international convention. You know, maybe the Saudis aren't, I don't know, but you know, but you know, but most of most countries are. And that's basically I'm that's ask you a question about that, actually. Um, so I get notices in the mail where they're saying you only owe us $1,300 to have, you know, your trademark uh, honored <laughs> globally or something. Is that a real thing or, or is this a scam? I don't think it's necessarily completely a scam, but basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to collect money from you and it's of dubious use to you. Uh -huh. I tell just about all of my clients. I mean, I mean, unless you're doing business internationally, it doesn't do you a lot of good to be in this directory of trademarks that's uh -huh. going to, you know, Germany or something. I mean, they, they advertise it. A lot of my clients send this to me all the time, you know, mm -hmm. that these uh, these solicitations, usually they're quite expensive, like thirteen hundred dollars to. And in most situations, unless you literally have a product that you are concerned about in another part of the world, either Europe or Asia or both, I would just ignore that. Mm -hmm. And that also leads me to the other situation. And I think, Donna, you've encountered this. Mm -hmm. There are so many people out there that are scamming trademark owners. So be really aware of this, um, especially if you've if you've registered a trademark, if you've applied for a trademark, they go and they skim the uh, the names of, of people that have applied for trademarks or have already registered a trademark. And then they send out these fake notices telling you your trademark is about to expire. Mm -hmm. When in reality, it's not it's not about to expire. <laughs> and, you know, luckily, I think none of my clients have ever sent them any money, but then they always ask you for money here. Let's we'll we'll, we'll keep your trademark from canceling. But yeah, I would never do that because these people are probably just pocketing your money and then disappearing. But a lot of my clients get panicky when they get these letters and they think it's from the trademark office. And you know, the thing is that they always, 
some of them use names that are intended to persuade people that it's from the trademark office. And some of them out and out just use United States trademark office. Just mm-hmm. absolutely fake, you know, completely. So, if, you know, if you've registered your trademark and you ever get any of those, then you know to just ignore them. Just toss them in the trash. Don't ever answer them. You also, you might get some letters from people abroad, too. that They'll say, like, well, uh, you know, we, we've now found that someone wants to register your trademark in our country, you know, in Slovenia or something. And to keep them from doing it, we can do you a favor if you send us some money. Don't ever don't respond to those either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's handy to have you to go, is this real? Is this real? <laughs> I've come to, oh, you, you may know, not God, believe how many of these that. clients send me. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, any other questions or comments, guys? Well, I, I have some, if anybody has questions, I've got a few more things. All right, go ahead. Um, usually Donna asks, um, you know, at the end about what advice that I would, give to people. And um, so I've I've been thinking about this. Now, this, of course, is really just sort of, it's sort of my way of doing things. So everybody has their own way of doing things. But I do think that some of these things would apply to really any business. And, you know, I think one of them is, for me, the importance of education about whatever it is that you're offering, making sure that you really know completely, you know, what your field is, staying abreast of it. And then um, if you're about, if you're going to interview a client or if you're or to talk to a client about business or if you're, if you're going to do a webinar or whatever, to really spend the time for adequate preparation. Because I think that prep, preparation for something, as opposed to just trying to wing something, it's always going to lead to more success than not. Uh, so that's just, that's one of my guiding principles. Donna can tell you that I was bugging her last night about these questions because I didn't want to come into this session being completely unprepared and doing a lot of uh, 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 you know. Um, And I guess the the last thing that I wanted to talk about, and I've I've really learned this myself, and probably all of you have already thought about it, but it's just really on my mind, and that's the importance of uh, resiliency. And I just went through, Donna knows this, I just went through a year of treatment for an illness. And it really, you know, it was like, a part, it was like another part-time job. And the, the, the thing that really got me through that was focusing on everything I could do to be resilient, you know, to be able to bounce back, you know, to, and I think that, you know, everybody that's a, women, a business owner, whether you're a woman or not, knows that it's hard. You know, it's not easy, you know, being, being a business owner. And so I found that one of the really important aspects of success is to really focus on everything you can do to be resilient. You know, and and if in my situation, um, I luckily had really great medical personnel that got me through it. But I also talked a lot to fellow women business owners that had been through similar situations. But it's sort of like anything that, you know, everybody has their own story, but anything that you can do. I think, and to, and to, I guess, recognize even in the excitement of starting a new business or, or uh, a new a new product or service, always to kind of, I think, have that in the back of your mind, like, how can I be resilient? So I just wanted to share that with you. And I also wanted to share a book. I'm just going to grab the book so I can, oh, here it is. Um, I wanted to share this book with you because, uh, and this book is called From Strength to Strength, and it's by a guy whose name is Arthur Brooks. Um, I will give the information to, to Donna about it, but what it's about, and to me, it's, this is not like truly like a self-help book, but um, this is one of, the first, one of the best books I've ever read because it talks about um, people planning for the second half of your career. People, people, you know, you're first, you start off and you're just, you're going to be a striver. You're going to try to be successful. You're going to try to launch your product or service and whatever. But at some point, that career, the second part of the career will start to wind down. And apparently, you know, some people have a harder time with that when you need to sort of slow down and not do as much of the same kind of striving and 
exercises you used to do. They have a hard time with it, especially people that have gotten a lot of awards and recognition in the first part of their career. And so what this book talks about is that in the second, the first part of your career is like a learning experience where you need to learn your your skills. The second part, according, you know, this author believes, and I believe, is using the skills that you've learned and use that for education. Use that to help other people learn about things. And I, I was so impressed with this. Um, you know, and it, it takes me, even if you're the start of your career, he's recommending that you start planning at, at that time, even for it. ultimately you're going to have to switch gears and and um, and address the second part of your career. And so I actually have made the education part uh, actually a, a feature of my business plan. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm committed to whenever I get a new client or even existing clients, I like to spend a lot of time educating the client, you know, about like the IP area, what what it, what it means, you know, for their particular trademark, how they can better protect their trademark, so that a lot of, so people don't just enter into like getting a trademark having not a whole lot of understanding about what it means or what it does. So I just wanted to share that with you. I just highly recommend this book. I think it's so great. Um, it's not like your typical. It's not like doing affirmations. It's not like it's not like that type of book. Okay, you know, I, I want you to talk about what actions you want us to take coming out of this around mm -hmm. our IP. And then I also want you to share how people can get a hold of you if they'd like to use your services. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I like to be gotten a hold of. <laughs> I like to be found. <laughs> but so first things first, I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I'm always hesitating, like to give people advice that, uh, you know, just like I'm, you know, in, in some kind of, you know, uh, a deity or something. But I guess one of the things that I would hope that people would do after this is actually think about their intellectual property. Um, if you have intellectual property, it's not registered, think about registering it. Um, and just, just, just think about like what the kind of things that I've talked about today. And then I think that, um, you know, I would, I would recommend that, um, that people, I, I guess, it, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to say because what I would do is not necessarily what everybody else would do. But Nan and I were talking earlier about the importance of play, the importance of of taking some time off from your work and the grind, and doing something that um, is enjoyable, like like tending to your social life as well as to your business life. Mm -hmm. And then a third thing to do to think about, I think is um, you know, finding another endeavor to, to get involved with. It's not necessarily your business, but that has some type of a spiritual quality for you. Uh, I'm not a particularly religious person. In this book, um, Brooks talks about people of faith and things to do about getting you know, more involved in the religious community. But equally important is just making connection with nature. And that's, that's my spirituality. Is, is getting more involved with nature. And as a result of reading this book, I signed up uh, for a educational program um, in Maryland that will enable me to get certification as a master naturalist in the state of Maryland. And so I'll be studying, learning all about terrain and soil and trees and all of these kinds of things. So um, I just share that with you. Not that everybody should do the same thing, but this is an example of what I would encourage people to do. Yeah. I, I, I watched a podcast or something, a webcast about getting back in touch with nature and the benefits. There's huge benefits to you psychologically, just of, of being out in nature. And I don't do it enough. It's a good reminder. It's a really good reminder. Well, that was actually, you know, the doctors that I dealt with when I was, it, when I was ill this last year, they were always encouraging that. They were talking, you know, one, one of them basically was encouraging me to walk a lot. You know, walk, this is very important. You know, to your health, walking, and I, I guess it's, it's. I was one of these people that's just been obsessed about my practice and my business life, and yeah. so you know now as a as a result, maybe the you know the illness was an important thing for me to stop myself in my tracks and actually get on a different track. But this was encouraged by health health professionals too. 
That is a really, really good reminder. That is a good reminder. Okay. Any final thoughts, comments, questions to share? Anybody? Thank you. It's a lot okay. to think about. I always get inspired every Friday. <laughs> good. Well, thank you all for being good listeners. Lifelong learner. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being here. It was terrific. I sure appreciate it. And I, I want to let everybody know, you really know your stuff. I, I know it personally. You've helped me. And I hope people, if they've got any trademark needs, that they do come to you. Oh, Susan, how do they reach out to you? Oh, yes. Um, well, um, my email address is the letter S for, for Susan, chairs, C-H-A-I-R-E-S, at chairs law, C-H-A-I-R-E-S-L-A-W.com. And I can be reached directly um, at 410-770-770. 9594. That is a landline here in Easton, you know, where I'm living. And the reason it's a landline is because I have terrible internet <laughs> where I live. Luckily, the library accommodated me today. Um, but it is a direct line, and there's a voicemail that can you can leave a message on, and I can call you back. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Oh, um, okay. So Nan's asking me to put it in chat. I need you to say your number again 410 770 9594. 9594. Okay, perfect. And just, you know, if, if anyone has any follow up questions, please feel free to, to call me. I, I welcome people's calls and inquiries. Perfect. Very, very good. All right. Well, you. thank you again for being here. Go ahead. Did you, did you have something you want to say, Marsha? So I'll call her. <laughs> thank okay. you. Okay. Right. Okay. That sounds good. Very good. Very good. Yes, I'll give a testimonial. All right. So thank you again for being here, everybody. Thank you so much, Susan. This has been terrific. Um, I, and I know that a lot of people are going to get value out of what you've said and done today. Um, I want to remind everybody that Purse Power is partnering with McLaren Cares to um, implement a program that helps underprivileged, underrepresented people get on the path to high paying technology careers. It's been used with 5,000 people around the world. Very, very effective. If you know of any employers that are looking for technology talent and want to help with this, please have them get in touch with me. Um, if you have an interest in supporting this program, please go to our page and buy us a cup of coffee. And uh, please like and share our social media pages. Tell people about this broadcast. Invite your friends. Um, any final comments, anybody? Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Remember, purse power. We have it. Let's we have use it. it. Let's use it. <laughs> Take Thank care. Bye-bye. Thank you.